Hello everyone and welcome to our Pharmaceutical Impurities webinar series. My name is Nicola Alton and I will be your host today. The title of today's webinar is Pharmaceutical Impurity Characterization Strategies for Success and I'll shortly be joined by our technical expert speakers Daniel Nicolau and Kathy Frankis. Next slide please. This is one of a series of webinars RSSL has available on a number of topics. Our impurities series will consider all aspects of impurities in pharmaceuticals and other products and will be run regularly every three months. We look forward to hosting our next one in early 2022, which will cover particulates, intrinsic and extrinsic impurities. If you would like to access any of our impurity webinars or are interested in our future webinars, please do not hesitate to contact me. Uh, previous slide, please. My contact details are on the screen. Now, before I hand you over to our technical experts, we have a few housekeeping requirements to run through. Firstly, if you have any technical issues, please do send us a short message in the questions box located at the right hand side of the screen. The team will then respond to you directly and will try to resolve your issue. Please note that some of us are working remotely, so do bear with us if you experience a slight delay with this. We also welcome any questions and you are most welcome to ask these throughout the course of the webinar by typing them into the question box located at the right hand side of the screen. At the end of the session, time permitting, we will try to answer as many of these as possible. If we don't have enough time to answer them all, we will do so offline and we'll share these with you after the webinar along with the slides from today's session. Today we are expecting the webinar to last around 15 minutes. A short survey will launch immediately after the webinar and it would be greatly appreciated if you could take a moment to complete it. Now to introduce myself quickly before we progress on with the webinar, I'm Nicola Alton and I'm the Life Sciences Impurities Lead within the commercial team here at RSSL. I'm responsible for a number of functions including using my expertise and working with a number of departments across the business to help clients who have particularly complex impurities investigation requirements. Next slide, please. And a quick brief about RSSL. Uh, we are an award-winning MHRA and FDA approved CRO. We pride ourselves at being a one-stop shop for all your analytical testing requirements and provide a comprehensive offering for impurities testing support. This ranges from identification of physical and chem chemical contaminants through to ENL studies, impurity isolation and sample purification as well as structural elucidation of unknowns. For more information, please not hesitate to contact me on the email address shown, or feel free to browse our website at www.rssl.com. So moving on, I'm joined today by two of our technical experts, Kathy Frankis and Daniel Nicolau, who are both senior scientists here at RSSL and will be introducing themselves. Kathy, would you like to start? Thank you, Nikki. Hi there, everybody. My name is Kathy Frankis, and as Nikki says, I'm a senior scientist here at RSSL. I've worked at RSSL for just over 10 years, and that time has been split between the functional ingredient and investigative analysis divisions at RSSL. My areas of specialism include ion chromatography and spectroscopy, um, and today I'm here to talk about uh, the NMR service offerings that we have here at RSSL. Before I joined the company, um, I did my PhD at the University of Bath, looking at the stereoselective polymerization of lactide, uh, so that's biopolymers, um, and I joined the company uh, back in 2010 following that completion. Um, as well as, as NMR, I also therefore have some interest in uh, physical property and materials um, testing. Hello everyone, my name is Daniel Nicolau. I've been here at RSSL for eight years, working primarily um, on LCMS. Hopefully we'll discuss that um, extensively today. As a trade chemist, um, for me, the characterization and investigation in impurities, particularly unknown impurities, have always been very interesting. And the use of LCMS is very important in these things. And I've been doing that extensively here at RSSL. I suppose the most important impurities that I've had to focus on recently are the notorious nitrosamines where LCMS has been a very important uh, tool to, uh, to do this. 
we won't talk necessarily about natural amines today, um, more uh, focused on the unknown impurities. To continue, the three key aspects um, will be discussed in the webinar today, where we're going to try to answer the question of why impurities are so important, and also to consider the various factors that are important in understanding, in characterizing and investigating a number of impurities. The key portion of the webinar will be focused on two very useful analytical techniques, namely LCMS, which I will describe to you shortly, and NMR, where Cathy will show you how wonderful a technique that can actually be. So the important question is why impurities are so important and why do they genuinely matter? Chemical reactions do not always go to 100% efficiency. In fact, most of the time they don't. And for more of these reactions, side reactions will frequently occur. Additionally, compounds like the API and excipients in a pharmaceutical product can degrade, especially over time or under certain uh, physical conditions. Those compounds can also react with each other to generate a wide variety of these of compounds and it's the, these resulting compounds these impurities relative to the product that you have that need to be identified and characterized these instabilities between the api excipients are important to understand additionally interactions with or migrations from packaging material extractables and leachables also uh, generate impurities within a particular product that would need to be investigated and characterized as such, the regulatory authorities have put in a, a wide variety of rules within the pharmaceutical industry, such that um, certain impurities greater than 0.1% relative to the API would require identification. And depending on the toxicity of those compounds, um, further investigation would be needed. In order to assess the toxicology of an impurity and the, the nature of that impurity, the identification and, and certain characterizations of those would need to be assessed. Additionally, these impurities may have a potential impact on the efficacy and integrity of a product. So in essence, there's quite a considerable level of reasons to investigate um, impurities within a particular product. Luckily for everyone, there are a wide variety of analytical techniques that can be used to identify and characterize these impurities. We tend to group these impurities in three main sections. Organic compounds, so those with carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and so on. Inorganic compounds, such as elemental impurities, which are frequently identified and characterized um, by ICP, MS, and OES um, techniques. And residual sulfons, the sulfons rather, that can occur within a particular product. And there are a number of techniques that can be used to identify and quantify those particular residual solvents, namely GC, FID, Iron chromatography for specific acids or GCMS. Today, in this particular webinar, we'll concentrate more on the organic impurities rather than the others. And for that, there are a wide variety of techniques that we use. Mass spectrometry and NMR are two key uh, techniques that we use, which will go into a, a much uh, greater depth in this particular webinar. But there are also other techniques such as um, FTIR or infrared where we can look at the absorption in the infrared spectra, looking potentially for certain functionality that might exist in a particular impurity or product. So too, the UV can allow us to identify specific um, chromophores, allowing us to potentially identify um, a structure that might exist within that impurity. XRPD, as I've listed, is a great technique to focus on solid pharmaceutical products namely looking at the crystalline structure and potential impurities that may impact on that solid. Again, there are a variety of other techniques which I haven't mentioned that look at specific characteristics of molecules that help us to identify and characterize certain impurities that might exist in your product. Additionally, these, these wonderful techniques can be combined with separative uh, techniques such as liquid chromatography, LC, HPLCs are a prime example, and gas chromatography, which can be, are frequently combined with the likes of UV and MS in the case of LC-MS, 
or GC using MS as well. It's also important to understand that in order to, impure, uh, to identify and characterize impurities, it may be necessary to purify that impurity out. There are two, a number of reasons rather, that can be um, the help to justify why we would need to apply a, separative, a separation or impurity, uh, purification step in, in, in the process. Less sensitive techniques might require a greater amount of an impurity because impurities tend to be on the, the low concentration side. Conversely, sensitive techniques may need certain compounds within the matrix, within the mixture, to be removed in order to obtain the sensitivity that that technique might um, apply. And there are a number of extraction techniques that can be utilized in, in order to purify the impurity out from your product. Traditionally, the likes of filtration and centrifugation and precipitation are frequently used, but we tend to use uh, the use of solid phase extraction, SPE extraction, and liquid-liquid extraction. And in both cases, we are utilizing certain characteristics within uh, the impurity that is different from the compounds within that mixture. So in the case of SPE extraction, uh, if say, for example, your impurity has a high charge, we may be able to utilize um, anionic or cationic exchange columns that bind those particular impurities while the remaining uh, compounds within that mixture are eluted out, allowing us to uh, increase the amount of impurity as well as purifying that impurity out. In the case of liquid-liquid extraction, we utilize the potential differences in solubility. In some cases, your particular impurity might be far more soluble in an organic solvent rather than water. Or conversely, you may want to wash out certain um, compounds within that mixture by using uh, an alternative solvent in that liquid-liquid extraction. Those are fantastic uh, techniques, and depending on the characterization and compounds within a particular mixture, these partic particular techniques can be utilized in combination with each other. Additionally, we need to remember that uh, techniques from many, many years ago, such as TLC, uh, thin layer chromatography, and flash col column chromatography, although old school, are also incredibly useful in these cases. We could also go for far more um, greater techniques, such as preparative HPLC, which allows us to take advantage of the HPLC separation capability on a much grander scale. And this can apply, especially with the HPLC and the separative techniques, in the combination of liquid chromatography and a mass spectrometer. So this is a hybrid system where we take advantage of the chromatography separation systems within an HPLC and the detection of a mass spectrometer. So this is our wonderful LCMS QTOF that we have here at RSSL. The HPLC uses traditionally a reverse phase system where we have the stationary phase in the column and a variety of mobile phase systems that allow us to separate out the mixture and hopefully the impurity on the HPLC column. Additionally, the advantage of an HPLC is that we are able to incorporate alternative detectors alongside the mass spectrometer. Traditionally, this would be a UV detector. The mass spec then, at the end, will allow us to detect mass ions to a much to high degree of accuracy, allowing us to investigate that impurity by this particular technique. So I suppose it's important to understand um, some basic, uh, basics around mass spectrometry. Mass spec uses or detects a mass to charge ratio of, of ions, denoted as M over Z. So on the mass side, it is um, denoted within a periodic table, the atomic mass in Daltons of a particular compound. So for example, carbon has a mass of 12. But we also have to understand that for all these elements, there are naturally occurring isotopes for each of them. So in the case of carbon, carbon-12 is in a, a, 
a high abundance, 99% naturally occurring, but there also is carbon-13, which can be traditionally used to carbon date a particular material um, as a, a way of understanding the age of a, of a compound. A very commonly observed isotopic um, set is chlorine. So chlorine-37 and chlorine-35 are naturally occurring in a one, two, two um, pattern. And that isotopic pattern is easily and recognizably observed in mass spectrometry. On the other side of the master charge is the charge. So ions would need to be charged in order to be detected by a mass spectrometer. And they can be positively charged or negatively charged. It's also important to understand that they can also be multiply charged. So as an example, if your compound has a mass of 230 with a single charge, you would observe a mass to charge ratio of 230. But if that same mass was doubly charged, what you would observe is 115 M over Z instead. So these various factors must be taken into consideration when investigating the data that's generated on a mass spectrometer. I also suppose it's important to understand how a mass spectrometer does work. There are a number of types of mass spectrometers that do occur. The most commonly found are triple quadrupoles. These are very useful in the quantitation of targeted species. So impurities that you know potentially exist and you would like to potentially quantify their presence in a particular material. That's something we won't be focusing on today. In order to understand and characterize uh, unknown impurities or generate a, a better understanding of the, the structure of a particular uh, compound, the use of a quadrupole time of flight or QTOF is far better. What I illustrate here is a simple diagram of the inside of a QTOF. And we start with the iron source. It's important to remove all the solvent that might be coming from your HPLC and to turn all your ions into the gaseous phase, which then get pulled in to the vacuum within the mass spectrometer. The next important stage to consider is the quadrupole. This acts as a mass filter, whether you're looking at a specific ion or a specific mass range, which you can set within the system. Once that compound, uh, that ion or um, ion range um, passes through the quadrupole, there's another part called the collision cell. This is particularly useful if you're looking at a particular targeted ion where you can fragment that and look at the fragment ions related to that particular ion, which I'll describe in a little bit more detail later. The most important part within a QTOF is the time of flight. As you can see, you have this rather peculiar flight path. It is designed in such a way that the system is set that we are fully aware of the distance of that flight path. And we take advantage of the fact that small ions, small mass to charge ratio ions, follow that path very quickly, whereas larger ions would follow that path a lot slower. And by taking um, calibrated ions, we're able to utilize the very simple equation um, speed equals uh, distance over time and correlate that with calibrated ions and we're able to generate um, an, an accuracy of those mass ions to as much as four or even five decimal places. And I'm able to illustrate that to you with a very simple example of, a wa of water and ammonium. In the case of water, you have two hydrogens and oxygen to give you a mass of 18 daltons. But also in the case of ammonium, where you have one nitrogen, 14, plus four hydrogens, again, giving you 18 Dalton. That's very difficult to separate that, the two, and you would never know. But the use of accurate mass and the presence of naturally occurring isotopes, as I described earlier, water actually has an accurate mass of 18.01 and ammonium 18.03. So on our mass spectrometer, we would very easily be able to distinguish the difference. And because of this fantastic feature, we're able to generate molecular formula for unknown compounds or specific ions that we are investigating. And then taking advantage of that and fragmenting that particular ion in the collision cell, as I described earlier, we can investigate those fragment ions and potentially generate some substructure information 
of that impurity. And that excellent mass resolution allows us to do both. So I'm going to provide you an example that hopefully illustrates all the great features of the LC and MS, especially when they're combined. In this particular example, there are two unidentified impurities in a commercial product uh, that appeared in a specific batch following manufacturing. And they identified these two impurities using HPLC UV. So in this case, UV at a specific wavelength of 270 nanometers. And you can see that two peaks have been highlighted at around 28.5 minutes and 29 minutes. And what we've been able to do is take that um, method that's been generated on the HPLC and combine the mass spectrometer to then give us a total ion chromatogram. So the total ion chromatogram are all the ions that appear in a defined mass range. In this case, it was a relatively large mass range because we didn't know or didn't know the um, identif identi identity of these particular impurities. And as you can see in the chromatogram of the TIC, there appears to be two peaks at the same retention time as these two unknown impurities by UV. And looking at the mass spectra at that particular retention time, we were able to observe two key ions that appear to be related to those two impurities. And we're able within the software to extract out that one particular ion in these two in the cases of these two impurities, ions of 304.2 and 308.2, and generate chromatograms unique to those particular ions. In this particular case, we weren't aware um, of the identify on the identity of these particular impurities, and importantly, we were not aware of whether or not these impurities were related to the API or excipients. So as I've described previously, the presence of these impurities may originate a, from a multitude of sources. So in this case, it would be uh, very useful to understand where they might have um, appeared. When looking at the mass spectra of these particularly, uh, these two impurities at the retention time, as I described previously, we're able to see a number of ions. In this example, particularly the impurity mass spectra at the top, we're able to see a number of ions that illustrate a great phenomenon that is very useful in understanding and characterizing impurities by mass spec, and that is the generation of adducts. So in this case, we're seeing three particular ions, 308.2, 330.2, 346.1, and these are generated as a result of the molecule that we're looking at, plus the attachment of a hydrogen, a sodium, and a potassium. And this is very frequently observed for organic compounds. Some particular compound groups don't necessarily generate this, but it, its presence allow us to identify what the molecular ion is, which is the M plus H charged molecule. In the impurity below, the, you can see that there are a number of ions present, but we were able to identify the 304.29 as the molecular ion for that particular impurity. And as I said, the accurate mass of these ions allow us to generate proposed molecular formulas. In this case, C18H29 for the top and C19H29. And initially, just on looking at those particular ions, you could possibly insert a uh, assume that these two impurities may be related to each other. Their molecular formulas are very similar. And in this case, it was important to understand that looking at the data alone may not necessarily allow you to identify and characterize an impurity very well. And it is important to understand the context of that impurity. In this case, the particular product we were investigating had an excipient, a flavoring, that was described as spiced. Spice, um, in this case, um, may be as a result of capsaicin. Capsaicin is a key ingredient in chili and peppers that makes things rather spicy hot in your food. And literature has also allowed us to understand what other compounds related to capsaicin exist naturally 
um, within that molecule. And we've been able to uh, observe or see the potential uh, inclusion of dihydrocapsaicin and homocapsaicin. Because when you look at the molecular formulas of those two particular compounds that are related to capsaicin, you can see that they correlate very well with our proposed molecular formula. In this case, with this data alone, it wouldn't necessarily um, allow any of us to ultimately conclude that these two impurities are indeed dihydrocapsaicin and homocapsaicin. So it's important at this stage to gain further information to help corroborate that assertion. As I said previously, the use of a QTOF allows us to look at targeted ions, fragment them, and look at that pattern and to see um, how they may relate to a particular structure. So in this case, we were able to target the 308.2 and the 304.29 and fragment them to generate ions that were made as a result of that particular um, targeted ion. In the spectra above, you can see that we've, I've highlighted one particular ion, 108 point, 184 rather, 0.1696. And again, allowing us to generate a potential molecular formula, that formula seems to allow us to propose a structure, as I've put there, that correlates very well with one portion of both the dihydrocapsaicin and the homocapsaicin. In this particular case, the impurity below actually had a molecular ion of 100, uh, a fragment ion of 182 rather than 184. But from the accurate mass, we would be able to and are able to determine that that is a difference of two hydrogens, which may be uh, allowing us to determine the potential presence or lack thereof of a carbon double bond in that alkyl chain. The other more stable ion that seems to be generated from both these targeted ions, as I've illustrated in the spectra below, is the 137.05. And again, the proposed molecular formula seems to correlate very well with the proposed structure of the other side, both homocapsaicin and dihydrocapsaicin. And you can see that particular structure, the benzene ring with various chain, um, additions to it, seems very well conserved in both the dihydro, the homocapsaicin, as well as capsaicin. And the molecular ion seems to be reasonably accurate in both those spectra. So in this case, again, we are able to provide further information that may corroborate the identity of these two particular impurities. So LCMS as a whole is incredibly useful and a powerful tool to identify and characterize impurities. The um, potential proposed molecular formula and the substructure information, as in the example that I provided, has been immensely useful in focusing on what these impurities might be. But there are limitations to LCMS, however much I would love to disagree. It's very difficult to determine regio and stereomycinus. So if you look at the double bond that exists in the homocapsaicin in the alkyl chain, that structure provided is at best proposed. I have no information by LCMS that would help me to determine the position of that double bond. So too, would I not be able to determine the position of um, the, ad, uh, the functional groups within the benzene ring of those particular compounds. Additionally, the higher the mass to charge ratio of impurity, the greater the number of proposed molecular formula. And if you're unable to have a very unique isotopic pattern, such as the presence of the chlorine, you may have a multitude of molecular formula that may make the identif identification of an impurity far more difficult. So it's important to understand that LCMS alone may not be useful and alternative techniques may be required. And as such, we will continue the, uh, the webinar with the next important analytical technique. Thank you, Daniel. So I'm going to talk a bit about high resolution nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. NMR provides a fingerprint of all organic comp components in a mixture or a sample. The response observed 
is dependent on how spin active nuclei in the sample behave towards each other in a magnetic field, which makes it a great technique for non targeted screening. However, the response observed by a molecule uh, also provides definitive information about molecular structure. And this is because of the interactions between the nuclei. Most commonly, we look at protons um, and their relative positions within a molecule. But other spin active nuclei can also be monitored, such as carbon 13, fluorine 19, phosphorus 31, and sometimes even nitrogen 15. Interpreta interpreting the spin interactions allows NMR to be used to confirm the identity of an unknown material without the need for reference materials, which lends itself very well to the elucidation of impurities when reference materials are not available or to help us understand the structures. A very simple example of how NMR data can be interpreted is shown at the bottom of the slide. Essentially, data that is collected by the instrument is Fourier transformed to, to provide a spectrum. And it is the splitting patterns, it is the appearance of the signals as well as the integrals that allow us to define the structure that has given rise to that spectrum. We interpret NMR data using four main considerations. Firstly, we look at the chemical shift, and this tells us how well or how shielded or how deshielded a particular signal is from the magnetic field. And therefore, it tells us about the environment that that particular proton or spin active nuclei finds itself. The signals in an NMR spectrum can also be integrated, and it is the integrals that allow us to specify how many nuclei are represented by any particular signal. Finally, the interaction between spin active nuclei results in measurable diagnostic coupling constants. And these result in very significant or diagnostic splitting patterns, which allow us to determine which nuclei are close enough to directly influence each other and their each other's spin behavior, and therefore are links or coupled in such to some degree within the molecule. Traditional limitations in the use of NMR have included poor signal resolution within a spectrum and overall poor method sensitivity. However, both of these are combat combated to a degree by RSSL's recent investment in a brand new spectrometer, a Brooker Neo 600 NMR with an eye probe. The new probe technology affords a signal to noise ratio approximately five times better than that what was achieved previously using our old instrumentation. And it can also be easily upgraded in the future with cryoprobe technology, which is well, well documented as providing superior signal to noise in terms of very, very low sample amounts. A larger magnet, a 600 rather than a 400, also provides superior signal resolution and allows for important information to be more easily extracted when interpreting resulting NMR spectra. An example is shown on the slide where from a full spectral width observation, there is not too much difference in the spectrum. However, when we focus in on a particular region, we see a far improved signal resolution on the right hand side. This allows us to identify coupling constants and key splitting patterns that allow us to elucidate unknown structures. Coupling constants and splitting patterns within an NMR spectrum can allow a particular structural isomer to be assigned in situations where only a molecular formula can be postulated, situations as Dan has just explained. For example, where LCMS has shown molecules containing substituted aromatic rings, Dan has mentioned that he would not be able to identify the exact positions of the substituents. The positions of these substituents 
will lead diagnostic patterns of signals in the proton NMR spectrum, resulting from the relative positions of the aromatic protons, as well as the chemical nature of the substituents. In the left-hand side of the slide, we have the case of 2,4-dichlorobenzoic acid. The splitting pattern that is observed confirms a, a 1,2,4-substituted ring. The key observation being that H5 is split by both H3 and H6 and results in two observed coupling constants, each of which match the coupling constants observed by the other protons. Where cis trans isomers are possible, again, similar to situations that Dan mentioned earlier, the observed coupling constants can be used to conclude which isomer is present. Um, on the right hand side, we see an example of this where the coupling constant for the trans isomer is significantly larger than the coupling constant observed for the cis isomer. Proton-proton coupling can also be observed through a second dimension in NMR, where nuclei positioned close enough to each other in a molecule to be affected by each other's spin are shown to be related either through bonds or through space. Both of these tools can help postulate a proposed molecular structure where a formula has previously been suggested by LCMS. All nuclei positioned in the same spin system will show correlations in a cosy spectrum, which stands for, or is an abbreviation of, proton-proton correlated spectroscopy. Whereas only those that are close enough together in space will give rise to a correlation signal in the nosy spectrum. And this can on occasion be used to confirm relative stereochemistry within a molecule. The slide shows an example of a quinoline derivative where a number of correlations are shown in the correlated spectrum, the cosy spectrum. And these correspond to signals where coupling is occurring through chemical bonds. The nosy spectrum shows fewer correlations as only protons close enough in space will give rise to signals, allowing the relative stereochemistry of the molecule to be potentially assigned. Two D correlation experiments can be used to track both one D and multiple connectivities. Sorry, can be used to track both one bond and multiple bond connectivities between two different spin active nuclei within a molecule, aiding structural elucidation. The most common types of experiments are proton carbon, such as the examples shown on the slide. Traditional 1D carbon-13 techniques have always suffered from poor sensitivity due to the low natural abundance of carbon-13, as Dan mentioned earlier. However, HSQC experiments, standing for heteronuclear single quantum correlation, result in shorter experiment times due to direct observation of the more abundant proton nuclei and indirect observation of the carbon-13. This particular experiment is also phase sensitive and therefore a distinction can be made between carbons bonded to an odd number or an even number of protons. And this information is similar to that which would be previously achieved using a 1D depth edited carbon-13 experiment. On the slide we can see proton carbon-13 HSQC data on the left-hand side and HMBC standing for heteronuclear multiple bond correlation on the right-hand side. This data is observed for quinine and we can see on the left-hand side far fewer correlations than are observed on the right-hand side. In the case of an unknown impurity, consideration of both these data sets would need to be taken to allow the structure of a molecule to be built up, taking into account the molecular formula 
previously proposed by LCMS, and also any fragmentation information that may have been available using LCMSMS. These types of 2D experiments can be applied to a range of spin active nuclei to help structure elucidation, depending on the nature of the nuclei that are present. For example, phosphorus, fluorine, or even nitrogen 15 can all be monitored with respect to their interactions with nearby proton atoms. One particular area that I want to focus on today is fluorine NMR. A significant proportion of new small molecule APIs coming to market contain fluorine. As a spin active nuclei with 100% abundance, fluorine 19 is an excellent nucleus to monitor by NMR. And versions of the 1D and 2D experiments described previously have been designed and are available to maximize this opportunity. When observing fluorine 19, it is important to consider that coupling will be observed not just between different fluorine atoms, but also between fluorine and any neighboring protons. Therefore, the ability to decouple these types of nuclei can be incredibly useful when elucidating a fluorine containing molecule or structure, or when looking to optimize fluorine, fluorine sensitivity. On the slide, we see the case of a very simple fluorine containing molecule, one fluoronaphthalene. And in the bottom left hand corner, we see how a proton decoupled fluorine experiment has a significant effect on the observed signal to noise, which will therefore increase the sensitivity of the technique. On the right hand side, we see versions of 2D through bond and through space correlation experiments, similar to the HMBC and NOSI experiments described a second ago. These can also aid structure determination. In the case of one fluoronaphthalene, the through bond connectivities can be observed uh, in, on the top right hand corner and the through space interactions can be observed in the, in the bottom right hand corner. And again, we can see a number of correlations between fluorine and various protons within the molecule, but only two correlations through space where the fluorine is physically close enough to H8 and H2 to give rise to a correlation. So during this webinar, we have discussed the importance of understanding and definitively characterizing pharmaceutical impurities. We've discussed a range of techniques available to help aid this process. However, selection of the correct approach is dependent on a number of factors, including the level the impurity is observed at and the level of, of sensitivity that is required for observation and therefore also characterization. The suitability of techniques will depend on the suspected nature of the impurity and where valuable information could be achieved from a particular insensitive technique, isolation or concentration of the impurity will almost certainly be required. Even when sensitivity of a te technique is good, there is also a possibility of interfering matrix effects. So some degree of extraction or purification of the impurity is normally required. However, there are many possible approaches that can be used, from more simple SPE or liquid-liquid extraction, all the way through to the possibility of using more complicated preparatory LC techniques. We have discussed two key characterization techniques in further detail. The use of LCMS provides us with accurate mass and isotope patterns, which allows molecular formula to be proposed. MSMS fragmentation can also provide substructure information. However, sometimes a number of proposed formula can be generated, 
and we must look for other clues in helping the determination. Perhaps there is a similarity to the API, or there is a sus suspicion that one of the excipients in the formula has something to do with it. Additionally, it is very difficult to distinguish between regio or stereoisomers using LCMS information alone. NMR provides information on the interaction of spin active nuclei in a molecule and can allow us to build up a molecular structure from the formulae proposed by LCMS. Or perhaps we can look for structural similarities with known ingredients of the formulation, again, to give us clues of the nature of the impurity. Unlike LCMS, it can provide information on radioisomers and under some circumstances, relative stereochemistry within a molecule can be determined. However, due to inherent issues in resolution and sensitivity with the technique, it is imperative the impurity is purified prior to analysis and that we have confidence that the purification process has been successful. And if we are to take one key point from today's webinar, it would be that in structural elucidation of unknown impurities, no one technique can provide all necessary information. An orthogonal approach using multiple techniques must be applied and the data must be cross-referenced um, to become to get to the right answer. Brilliant. Thank you, Daniel and Kathy, for that really informative discussion. Um, so we've just got a few questions that have come through that I'll go through now. And we've got um, James has asked, what is an EIC chromatogram? So an EIC, the extracted iron chromatogram, is a, a great way to um, look at a unique iron over the course of the HPLC analytical run. So um, if a particular iron is related to a particular compound, in the case that I, I hopefully provided the example of, you would see that particular iron um, only present at that retention time. So the advantage of looking at all the ions together and then looking at only one ion from that data set allows us, especially in the, in the case of utilizing HPLC and MS together, to correlate a particular ion to a specific retention time. So it's an, in, an invaluable tool to understand um, if a particular ion may be related to a specific compound that we've observed in the UV chromatogram. Thank you, Daniel. Um, we've got another few questions coming through. I think we've got time for two more. Uh, would you normally try to synthesize a suspected impurity to use this to confirm the structure identities? That's a question from Wolfgang. So that's certainly one possibility. Um, it's not something that, that we um, offer as a service here at RSSL, but we have worked with clients uh, where we have been able to report to them um, a structure based on a combination of both LCMS and NMR. Um, and really the final checkbox exercise is to go, and work, go away, synthesize that impurity, and then we rerun it using NMR and LCMS and just make sure that all the data ties up. It's the way of really tying up those loose ends. Especially when you don't have a commercially available uh, standard. In some cases, if uh, the synthesis is actually incredibly challenging, we may want to look at very similar compounds to the proposed structure and see if that may correlate or allow additional justification for the proposed structure. Brilliant. I've got one more question for you. Uh, how do you go around identifying imps impurities detected by HPLC UV methods that is not MS compatible? That's a question from Chatali. So in that circumstance, the likelihood is that you have observed it in the, uh, the UV by um, HPLC. Um, if it doesn't respond um, by mass spec, um, what I I suppose I didn't describe in detail in this particular webinar is the various combinations of possible mass spectrometers that might exist. So um, the fact that it is UV active would suggest a chromophore of some sort. Um, we may want to use different ion sources or different um, uh, mass spectrometers. 
that might potentially uh, suitably ionize that compound. If in some cases that that particular ion is not ionizable, firstly, that is a fantastic clue to indicate its possible structure, but there are alternative techniques such as GCMS that um, fragments or ionizes a particular um, compound in a far different way and you are li likely to then be able to generate that um, or some mass uh, spectra information. In some cases when that is not particularly possible, the separation of that particular impurity and then analysis um, by another technique such as NMR may be a more appropriate approach. Brilliant. I'm just going to ask one more question from Iodemi. Um, how could a protocol be set up bearing in mind, as stated, a basket of methods may be required? Well, that's the challenge, isn't it, really? <laughs> I think that's a great question, and I think it's a question that the industry at the moment is trying to, to work out. Um, in terms of, of gen, general protocols, um, we have, uh, based on our experience, there would be um, routines and um, advised um, ways of preparing samples. I think what's really, really key is the combination of the data and the consideration of all the data. And hopefully that's, that's a point that people will be taking away from this webinar. And, and when it comes to, to protocols and um, considering the data from only one source, you're very, very easily to, to miss something. So you can, we can put protocols in place to make sure that the day-to-day -day and that the actual, um, the lab part of it all, all goes smoothly. But when it comes to interpreting the data, you really do need to sit down and intrinsically challenge it to make sure that everything um, makes sense. Great. Unfortunately, we've run out of time for all the additional questions, um, but thank you very much for attending this webinar today and we hope you found it useful. Thanks also to our speakers and uh, just to remind you, our next impurities webinar will be held in March 2022. Thanks again for your time.